Shall we begin? Yes. Okay. Thank you everyone for being here today. What an honor it is to have the panel of women here with us. Um, we all know that women in cannabis is quite a phenomenon. Uh, something they're even calling the grass ceiling, and it's not the glass ceiling at all. It's actually referring to the limitless possibilities of how high we can all get. We also know that the part of the cannabis plant we traditionally are in love with is the female reproductive part, unfertilized of the female plant, so not anybody can deny that there is this female connection, and today we're here to celebrate that. So I'm super grateful to be moderating this panel. Our first lady here is Lisa. What'd you say? Sunberg? Yes, Lisa Sunberg. Exactly. Lisa Sunberg. She is uh, president and owner of the Nation's Business Link. Um, our next woman here is Tina. And Tina is the tribal chairwoman of the... Just say it again. Say it again. Benton Paiute Tribe, thank you so much. I'm very afraid I was about to really mess that one up, I'm sorry. And then lastly, we have uh, Emma Snacks. Emma is um, the California Legislative Liaison for the Cherokee Nation. Oh, well, I'm from the Cherokee Nation with CCIA. With CCIA, yes. forgive me. Okay, sorry everyone for messing that up. Okay, okay, perfect. Well. We'll start with the first question, and I guess maybe we can go down the line and then switch orders if that's okay with you. Okay, perfect. And then at the end, I think we'll have time for questions as well. So, what have been some of the challenges you have faced as an Indian woman getting into the cannabis space? Well, I, I'm a member of the Trinidad Rancheria, so I'm okay. okay. I have to get closer. Yeah, that one might be better. Would you prefer? It's on enough. You have to get like right on it. You know what? That mic is a little bit. Yeah, it's like freakishly close. Do you want to come up and answer if you want as well? Are you taking the mic off? Oh, yeah. Okay, that's a bit better. Technical difficulties. Let's make this easy on ourselves. So, I'm a member of the Trinidad Rancheria, um, and uh, it's located in the Emerald Triangle and in Humboldt County, right on the coast. And so, and, and as a native, you know, member of a tribe and, and being female, I think the challenges that I that I found because I never played in the you know black market or anything like that. I came from a um, gaming industry of all things and so uh really it's like trying to find out where to interject you know um, and finding the business models that are going to succeed and so i started looking for the bottlenecks and, and leveraging sovereignty and all the knowledge that i have in, in uh, developing product you know for other industries and so um i really think that it's not so much for me, uh, you know, I just have to look at what barriers that I have and what benefits. Not so much of a barrier, what benefits do I have as being native and, and being on a reservation. So I look at that um, as, as not a, a hindrance, but possibly assets. And so it's more like having a lever jack. What tribe are you again? Trinidad Rancheria. Yeah, we're just north of Eureka, about 30 miles. Amazing. Turn that situation into a leverage. <laughs> yes. Same question? Same question. Do you want to hear it again? No. Nope. I kind of did. <laughs> <laughs> so the barrier that has been for my tribe. My name is Tina Braithwaite. I'm the tribal chairwoman for the Benton Paiute tribe. And we currently have a 20,000 indoor growth facility. When we first started um, two years ago, we were getting all gung ho because we were ready for California to legalize uh, Prop 64. And once California was legalized Prop 64, we realized that there was no language uh, pertaining to tribes in the Prop 64 language. Um, 
And I'm a new tribal leader. I've been doing this for a little over a year. So I had no knowledge that tribes were being locked out of the industry. Uh, since the Prop 64 language was introduced and passed, uh, the state came out with this little paragraph to tribes. If you want to get into the cannabis arena, you have to waive your sovereign immunity, give up civil jurisdiction, and pay full tax. Um, we were good with the tax parity, uh, but tribes can't just waive sovereign immunity. Um, you know, it takes a whole general council. That would just be like asking the state of California to waive, you know, their rights. You know, the governor can't just do that without the whole state, you know, all of the people agreeing. And it, it's the same for the tribes. Um, so we did what we had to do. Uh, we moved forward. I opened up the first state recreational dispensary in California, April 2017. We just had our 420 event uh, last week, so we anniversary one year. Um, we've had a lot of issues though, you know, January 1st we were sending our product out to be tested and, uh, you know, since they legalized we can no longer um, get our product tested and that really concerns me, um, you know, because my main goal is to put out a good safe product, you know, for the health and safety of the consumer. So um, I just recently hooked up with another tribe that has got a laboratory on site, so we'll be uh, sending our product out to be tested. But, uh, you know, with um, everything that happened and, you know, the legalization and all their regulations that came out, we have to be fully integrated. So we extract, we produce, uh, we make our own edibles, and we are making some CBD isolate. Uh, you know, making some products out of CBD because a lot of our patients, they want to be healed, they don't want to be high. So thank you. Thank you. So um, my name is Emma Snugs. I'm an enrolled citizen of the Cherokee Nation, um, Deer Clan, Oklahoma band, um, which means I'm an out-of-state Indian. Um, I'm also a city Indian. Um, and um, I am um, the uh, legislative liaison for the California Cannabis Industry Association. Um, and so we were proponents of Prop 64. Um, we work very closely, I, I know, I'm the bad guy on the panel. <laughs> but um, we uh, work very closely with legislators, lobbyists, um, you know, lawmakers, um, and regulatory agencies. Um, and, and, and so I guess uh, my challenge um, is that um, I'm obviously phenotypically a white woman, um, but I was raised Indian. Um, you know, my, my blood is as red as, as red as to be. Um, I'm proud to be Salaki. Um, so I'm privy to conversations that are um, often negative, um, you know, and um, so that's been very challenging um, for me. There have been days when I wanted to throw in the towel and leave. Um, and, and, and sometimes I, I would say most often, um, you know, the negative stereotypes and the um, assumptions that are made come from a place of ignorance. And so um, I guess not a lot of people know or understand, but um, the relationship between me and um, the women on the stage, for example, um, is always, always respect to them, whether they're a year older than me, two years older than me. Um, one, we respect one another because we're women and we're native women. Um, and two, um, you know, there's an auntie, niece, or sister to sister relationship between all Native women, and I, I would like to say all women, period. Um, but um, with that said, you know, um, I'm, I'm mentored by the other Native American women who are in cannabis, um, and, and they've helped um, reframe things for me so that I can, um, you know, when I am met with those challenges, and, and, and those, you know, those comments come from everywhere, not just, you know, um, not just folks that you would assume make those sorts of comments or, you know, um, I, I learned to take those opportunities um, and look at, look at them as teaching moments, <laughs> right? So, and, and um, use whiteness um, as a, a tool for teaching, right? My own whiteness um, and my own experiences as, as, as um, teaching moments um, for others. And, and sometimes it's not a win. Sometimes you take an L, um, but you walk away knowing that um, you were able to do a little explaining that day um, and bring people a little closer to respecting sovereignty. So that's... 
Thank you. And I think like one of the common themes of being a woman is that we always have to be resourceful. Mm -hmm. And we always pay attention to details. Yep. <laughs> I know I just said always twice, but I think it's kind of true. Yep. So. Um, if you want to start with the next one, or if you ladies want to rotate, however order, whoever wants to answer next, uh, the next question is, how did you decide what sector of the market to get involved in? <laughs> and why? <laughs> so, um, in December 2014, the Coleman Random came out along with Wilkinson thereafter, and it opened the door, I think, more on a, a, a national level that tribes could pursue this. However, you know, and so for me, I'm a, I'm a political ninja. I don't, you know, um, I don't look at barriers. I just, you know, want to expand and continue to look for opportunities just for my tribe for whatever vertical it is. And so cannabis opened up, because that's what my company does. I, um, I'm in a lot of different things, but because cannabis is, is in my backyard, literally, and uh, if Humboldt County doesn't you know, raise itself up, you know, it's another industry that came through my tribe's backyard that needs to survive. And so I'm very concerned about it from that perspective. And so I started going to reservation to reservation and learning about who is doing what and seeing what's working and not working. And I found myself not only on Tina's reservation checking out what she was doing, but also Santa Isabel, um, as well as Suquamish, and, which is the first compacted tribe up in the state of Washington, and as well as the, what's the other, Squawks and Island. And uh, a good friend of mine opened that facility, the first recreational facility, right next to a casino. So everybody was saying, oh, nobody wants to get, you know, get a cannabis, you know, uh, business, get a cannabis business in California because they're afraid they're going to lose their casinos and the state's not going to allow it. it. What I'm finding is just like as different as the counties are, as the states are, the regulators in our own jurisdiction has a great impact on what we can do and can't do. And so what I did learn is that the tribes that have great relationships with their local senators, congressmen, state assembly people, local county sheriffs, all of those types of relationships uh, are really key. And I was raised on the heels of a mom who just got awarded the, or just got recognized as the longest seated chairwoman in the state of California. And she, as well as represented the state of California for the National Tribal Chairman Association. And I got drug around nationally and have been able to see that that um, all the, the tribes, even though they're different, um, you have to, we have to get involved, not just as a cannabis industry, but tribes, will, you know, we have to build those relationships with our congressmen and senators. You know, you know, this is kind of a disruptive type of thing that you know, the cannabis industry holds to the pharmaceutical industry. It's disruptive, and they don't like it. And so, uh, and so we scratch our heads and wonder why congressmen and senators are not passing these laws or taking it off of Schedule 1. You know, I just came back, Tina and I both been in D.C. lobbying on any help because I'm also on a health board representing nine tribes in Northern California, and we both sit on um, a statewide board that represents 45 tribes on any help. And all we see is big pharma out there and as well as when it comes to cannabis, it, you're going to see the law enforcement and the, and, and the privatized prisons yeah. are the biggest lobbies out there. So we have to rise up to that. You know, you see now some of those guys are retiring and you're out of Congress and what are they doing? They're all jumping on the bandwagon with all these hemp companies, right? They're all wanting to get in the game now. So those guys are going to be the influencers. They are going to be the normalizers you know, to this industry. And I can just say that the tribes that have been successful are the ones that built the relationship and normalized you know, uh, cannabis to their local jurisdictional people that they're going to have to deal with. Um, and if uh, I, I've got a tribe in uh, Round Valley 2006, they've been growing. They've been regulating themselves since 2006. Not 2014 or 15 or just recently. 
they've been that long. They exercise the sovereignty as soon as the Prop 64 passed. So um, where I interjected is, first of all, study. And so I've been leveraging my own background. I came from financial services and I helped build financial, uh, the financial backbone for the casino industry and market it nationally. So now I'm looking and taking that talent and using it for the back, for the, you know, the backbone of this industry. So um, payment processing, banking issues, those types of things. I can't grow anything. I'll leave that to Veronica. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to grow anything, so. Um, so that's where I started to look at. Is this really studying? Because you get to look at every tribe as pianos. Um, you have to look at your people asset. You have to look at the assets of your relationships locally, uh, as well as what kind of you know laws that we can leverage, things like that. So sorry that took a long time. But. It's okay. Sovereignty is sounding really good to me right about now. <laughs> I'm getting regulated big time. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I tried to tell everyone. <laughs> Please, Tina. Um, so back in 2015, um, I came in in October of 2015, and we were thinking about cannabis, my tribe was. Um, of course, everybody was sitting on the fence. They were scared because it is still federally illegal to grow on tribal lands. Um, but my people, after educating my people and the positives to cannabis and CBD and the healing properties that the plant has, um, we voted in May of 2016, and out of 140 people, we got five no's. 135 of my tribal members voted yes to approve and legalize cannabis on our reservation. Um, currently, I have five elders that are, those five no's are five yeses because <laughs> they're using cannabis now. I have an 82-year-old elder who was taking between 10 and 20 Vicodins a day and through a topical and some CBD tincture, he's pain, not totally pain free, but he's relieved of his pain. Um, you know, I have tried to explain to them about every over-the-counter medication, every prescription drug, how it has a side effect, uh, Tylenol, you know, baby Tylenol was killing our baby's livers, you know, 20 years ago, and I'm sure it's not gotten any better. Alcohol, you know, uh, cirrhosis of the liver, we've seen it on my reservation with my own people. Um, opioids, you know, kidney failure. Um, you know, so I've tried to educate people, and I, I believe that through education um, throughout the country, we can get this legalized and descheduled because cannabis, you know, there's no side effects to it. I mean, I would rather be on the highway with somebody who is high off of cannabis than somebody who's drinking alcohol because the alcohol person that's drunk is going to be doing 85 down the freeway and the cannabis consumer is going to be doing 45 thinking he's doing 85 down the freeway. <laughs> So, I mean, you know, I mean, it's just about educating, you know, the stigma. We just need to get all of that removed and, you know, educate the public on what it's doing out there and how good it's doing for, you know, not just, you know, um, like I said, people aren't looking to get high. They're looking to get healed, you know, and if we can, you know, decrease our opioid use, I mean, it's known, it's been proven that it is decreasing the opioid addiction and the methamphetamine use and even the alcoholism, you know, I mean, through the cannabis plant, I think that, you know, we really seriously need to, you know, look at that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so <clears throat> how I came to be in this industry is, um, is sort of like typically native, I guess I pray for opportunity, right? Um, I, I mean, that may sound incredibly simple, but I... Um, I was a single mom and survivor of domestic violence and um, made my way through community college. I consumed um, cannabis rather than antidepressants because I was a single mom and I couldn't be fuzzy. Um, you know, I had to be sound of mind in order to raise my son and, um, and study and work. 
um, you know, um, so, um, you know, in order to sort of um, stave off uh, anxiety, um, you know, I consumed responsibly. <laughs> um, you know, made my way through community college, ended up at UCLA. Um, I studied um, political science and American Indian studies as uh, my, my undergraduate work, and my graduate work was in American Indian studies. Um, left um, grad school, came back to Sacramento, um, and a colleague buddy of mine said, hey, I really want you to meet these folks, um, and ended up um, assisting um, Nate Bradley, um, who was the, um, at that time, executive director and founder of um, the California Cannabis Industry Association. Um, and frankly, he just uh, the, gave me a lot of opportunity to learn and grow, um, which I think was incredibly important. Um, in large part because um, I sort of had this nurturing vibe that is um, traditional, um, right? So I think, you know, we, there's a lot of talk of um, what feminism is and what that means in this space, but um, frankly, being willing to go grab coffee and go grab sandwiches and take notes and, and um, you know, People would say assist, right? Work as an assistant, but I would say, um, you know, take up that nurturing role that that business is required in order to grow. Um, you know, people need people need a little love when it's raining outside. Um, you know, I, I remember when the um, director of office, the Office of Traffic Safety, you know, the state of California, came in the door. It was really windy and cold outside, and I ran and I grabbed her some hot tea. Right, <laughs> which is a very like traditionally you know native thing to do. You know, we welcome our visitors, we feed them, we you know um, we treat them like our own, and we treat everybody. You know, I think we're the expectation is that we you know treat folks well. You know what I mean? And so I think that um, element um, really helped me, and so I was eventually promoted um, to ledge liaison and able to register as a lobbyist, a big old bad lobbyist. <laughs> um, but that's how that's how I came to be um, in this space, um, and of course I'm native, and so I look, that lens for me is always there. I'm like I know that whatever it is that is happening, you know, in this world, native people are doing it, and it may seem as if it's on the peripheral um, to you know mainstream society, but I know that we have usually done it first, <laughs> and that we're often um, doing it very well. So I so I, I knew that I you know I, I knew folks um, that were already in the cannabis industry that were native, um, and 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 I guess um, I was just blessed to be at that intersection of um, a Native American and in cannabis. I, I consider that a real blessing. Beautiful. <laughs> you can hang on. Oops. Hello. Oh, we'll pass it back. You can hang on to that if you want. Oh, I think my mic's out. Oh, that's okay. You can hear me. I'm not even saying anything important, but. Um, the next question is, what are some of the benefits of being a native in the cannabis realm? Okay, um, Okay. for me, um, being a native woman to me means also being a mother, being an aunt, um, being a wife, um, being a sister. Um, and I think um, an example of how that's benefited me, um, I sat through um, the other day, we're, we're currently um, tracking 55 cannabis bills. Um, that's a heavy load, right? That's a, that's a real heavy load. Um, but uh, I sat through um, hearing after hearing um, for opioid use, minors in opioid use, and elderly people in opioid use, and opioid addiction, and death caused by opioid addiction and overdose, and then street drug use um, as a result of opioid addiction, right? Um, and sandwiched in between all those opioid bills was our cannabis bill. Right, um, and, and and I think I, I know you mentioned some common sense policy, um, and I think um, you know I'm currently the only um, team member at CCIA that is also a parent, um, and so I certainly as as a as a native as a native woman, um, it's a benefit to me that I my children come first, my family comes first, and everything I do and everything I build, even professionally, um, is centered on family. And so for me, the approach that I take, when my son comes home and tells me, um, mom, he's 15, mom, everyone at school is taking Ritalin. And mom, what is a pressed pill? And mom, you know, um, so-and-so just started taking you know, antidepressants? And, and, and while I know, as a mother, especially a Native American woman, um, because our children are taken from us by Child Protective Services at a rate of more than four times that of any other minority, Right, so we're we're at high risk for getting our kids taken from us and not ever getting them back. Um, I know that I can't just say, 
you know, you should go to school and tell them <laughs> and tell them what I do for a living and, and this and that, right? I can't say that, but what I can do on the legislative level is um, advocate for research and development and, and, and advocate, you know, I, I put on my face, right? And I put on my badge and I put on my pen and my blazer and I go advocate um, and it, in, in a space, but my intentions, and I think, you know, for, for us and for Native people in general, um, you know, intentions are everything. And we're very process oriented people because, you know, what you put into something is, is, is really what you, what you get out of it and what you gain from it. And so I think, you know, um, being, being family focused, being a mother first and foremost in every space I am, um, is my benefit, my blessing, and I and I hope that's what I bring to the cannabis space. <laughs> Can I go? Sorry. Um, so being Native American, I was not ever raised Native American. Uh, it was unfortunate. My mom was a Native American, full blood. My dad was Caucasian. Um, and my mom was ashamed of being Native American and I could never understand that. So I never really got to exercise my Native American rights until maybe I was 17 or 18 and then I started learning about my culture. Um, and I started um, hanging, getting to hang out with my grandma who was the most strongest Native American woman I have ever met in my whole life. Uh, she instilled a lot of Native American values. She taught me culture, and it's always about my people. I always put my people first. Um, my people are everything. Our children are suffering. You know, our children, they're getting hooked on all of these opioids. I lost my niece a couple years ago. She was 18 years old, graduated high school, stole her grandma's... Um, uh, what was she taking? Methadone. She thought it was a liquid pain medication and the grandma was getting methadone by prescription from our IHS facility uh, for um, severe back pain. And um, so she stole this methadone. It was in a bottle. She thought it was like a liquid Vicodin or a liquid Percocet. Went to a party, dumped it in two glasses, one for her and one for her friend and they went to sleep and never woke up. That was a couple years ago. And ever since then, it's been, you know, trying to educate, educate our children, you know, push them to, you know, better themselves. And, you know, even though we're a cannabis tribe, we don't allow our children anywhere near our cannabis activity. Um, we, being a reservation, you know, we've had to um, bring in all of our own programs um, we started a substance abuse program. Uh, we created an elders program. Um, you know, we're trying to educate our people um, as far as, you know, the, the healing sides of cannabis. So it's been, um, it's, it's been an educational path for me. Uh, being a tribal leader, I try to advocate for health care. Um, you know, I, I really seriously think that through cannabis, you know, that these reservations, once they start seeing the positives, that, you know, they'll see that, you know, the methamphetamines and the opioids and the heroin use will drop. Um, on my reservation, our, we have had one call since January for the, in the last six months. We had one call, it was New Year's Eve, and it was an alcohol-related um, situation that two people were drunk and they were fighting it was something really ridiculous but that's the only call that's been you know any time that the sheriff has called, been called out to our reservation because our people are consuming cannabis you know they've calmed down you know um you know they don't even we don't even see them out roaming around at night anymore so it's a, it's a positive thing for me um you know and and my people you know my elders they approve it, and that really is, you know, through ed that's through education. That's not, you know, through anything else. It's through educating them that they're on board with cannabis and, you know, seeing how it's working for our people. Um, so I come from a medicine family traditionally, and I uh, and so and I still am actively involved in our cultural and ceremonies, and. You know, 
I think the women, we're just our natural uh, watchdogs of our communities. And I think, you know, you're looking at some watchdogs right now, and there's something not going right, you're going to see the women, you know, leaders, you know, in our community, because we're more matriarchal leadership, you know, type of, you know, communities, at least in my area. And, and so I look at, it, it, it's almost like you know, answering the other question. What motive, you know, what motivated me to get in this industry is part of. It, we were natural, natural plant-based med- medicine people. So cannabis is just another plant to me that that we were utilizing, and it's our job to find out what it's great for, as well as other things. And so it, you know, as well as being on the health board, and I am very acutely aware of the opiate and other. Uh, drug addictions where the Advil or Tylenol, they're either blowing out your liver or your kidneys, things like that, as well as just uh, it, it not being, uh, those are things that can be uh, just as harmful uh, as, 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 as uh, uh, opiates and things like that. When people look at those kind of drugs, I, I see people, more people are dying from overeating. <laughs> <laughs> all of this other stuff when you want to really get down to it. So I'm really kind of like a health advocate and these guys all know that I'm usually at the gym trying to get buffed out here because I'm losing weight. And that's another thing too, but at the end of the day, as a mom um, and as a community mom, I, I would say to my own community, it's like it, what, what I find what drives my passion is because I do see the, the addictions and things like that. And cannabis in our community, I believe, is just one vehicle to actually generate revenues. It's like Tina's doing on her res- reservation. She's so remote that a casino is not going to be as good as, you know, downtown, you know, in the, in the bigger cities, as well as in my reservation. It doesn't make enough to, to, to sustain our government because these, we are tribes. We're not private in, in, in individual businesses. We are tribal governments, and we have to fund our people that way. So this is just a business that we're utilizing to be able to do that. And people need hope. We need education. We need a lot of things in our communities. And I, I find, and I can only use myself as, a, as, a, as an example, when I was growing up and being in high school, I loved sports. And, I, and, and if I didn't have that as a passion that drove me more, I would, I would have drank myself to oblivion. You know, because I was, you know, on that path my freshman year, and um, and I love sports more, so I didn't like hang over yeah. uh, <laughs> or anything else. And so I'd say the same thing with with any kind of drugs. You don't have time for it when you're trying to really when you're up to something really good in life. So and I think we need to we need to utilize the revenues to be able to create that in our communities. Thank you. And the last final question, if you want to start with this one, Tina, you're welcome, um, is how can the tribes benefit the cannabis realm? How can tribes benefit the cannabis realm? Are you talking like the market? Or are you, are you talking like... Spiritually, like financially, as far as intellectual property goes, uh, maybe it's through infusion methods and medicine-making methods? So... My tribe is um, what I call fully integrated. Um, We weren't going to be fully integrated, you know. We were going to grow and sell cannabis off the reservation into the marketplace. We grow some beautiful strains. Uh, We were doing CBD, um, you know, and we had one full room of just beautiful CBD. And then the California regulations came out and locked the tribes out of the market so we um we had no choice we had to do something so now we're we have to supply our little dispensary because we cannot get into the california marketplace so we opened up this dispensary we stock our own um and we make this topical that is phenomenal out of cannabis um it, I have a list of a hundred people that are waiting for it because we can't keep up with production. They come to our reservation. This topical works wonders with people. I have a gentleman that had skin cancer. He put the topical on his lesions on his arms and they're gone. They're healed. Um, 
My elder uses it on, a, on his broken hip. He's up moving around, you know, people. I've been giving it to elders throughout, you know, everywhere I go. If I'm at a tribal function and there's an elder that I see that's walking with a cane or they're in pain I'll, and I have an extra jar, I'll just give it to them. Try this. You know, and then the next time I see them, they come running up to me. Do you have any more of that topical? Because it really works. You know, if I can help somebody get off of the meth or the opioids, you know, or a, an elder be pain-free, that's my goal. I've met my goal, and, you know, it, it is really, it makes me happy when I hear somebody that, you know, has tried this topical and tells me that it works for them and that their pain is relieved. So, it, you know, that's, that's a good thing for us. That really is one of the best feelings in the world yeah. is participating in a cannabis miracle or witnessing one. Better when you get to participate in one. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I guess, um, so I guess, I guess uh, indigeneity and in, in, in diversity, you know, I know there are a lot of conversations right now about um, diversity and there's a lot of development in the, in the um, you know, policy or on the legislative level and the local level um, to um, be inclusive, right? Um, because a regulated market is, in a sense, creating barriers to entry. And those barriers um, are impacting communities um, that have really taken the brunt um, of um, cannabis um, in the legal sense. And, and folks have lost years of their lives in prison and um, you know, really just been used and, and abused by the system. And so um, I'm gonna say diversity, um, but really um, indigeneity. Um, I, I think that um, when you think about diversity and you don't include American Indians in that conversation, you're doing yourself um, a great injust, you know, a great injustice. And I and, and I think that it um, it really speaks to um, settler colonialism and what it means to erase and replace a people, um, and, and and not including American Indians in that conversation is perpetuating genocide. Um, and and I you know. Um, and that includes other minorities. I think that that's, you know, that, that, that that's um, something that needs to be um, touched upon. We, we are accountable. Um, as, as a mixed person, I am accountable, you know, um, for making sure that this isn't just an inclusive space, but that we honor the people because I'm, as, as, a, as an out-of-state Indian, it's my responsibility to uphold sovereignty wherever I am. And I can't identify as an indigenous person if I don't also honor these sovereign nations, right? Because this is where I am, um, and so I think um, you know that that diversity piece. But I'm gonna I'm gonna go a step further, and I'm gonna say um, I'm gonna say they also bring honor and and integrity. Tribes bring honor and integrity to a space that has um, become riddled with um, greed, for lack of a better term, right? And we saw this. I you know the people often refer to um, you know the uh, emerging cannabis business, the illicit business, as the green rush. And for me, that's an offensive, that's a, an extremely offensive, and, and I know there are businesses named Green Rush, and I apologize, you know, but, but <laughs> it, can be, it can be very offensive, um, if not framed correctly and respectfully, because the American Indian people here, California Indians, experienced the uh, gold rush in a very different way 